Today we are concluding our short series on a primer of the Christian life. And if you remember when we introduced, I said a primer was an early uh, textbook uh, that was used to teach people how to read, children how to read. Now I realize that I am giving away my age by asking this question. But did anyone learn to read using the Dick and Jane books? Oh, okay. Um, some of you are saying the who and what. Um, the, the Dick and Jane, the books were based on the characters, Dick and Jane, who, who had a dog named Spot and a kitten named Puff. And it is possible that the first sentence that you learned to read was, see, Spot, run, run, Spot, run. As we began this new year, I thought it would be helpful and, and I was hoping that it would be good for us as a congregation just to come at the beginning of the new year and take a look at some basic truths about the Christian faith again. And so we began by asking, what does it mean to be saved? What is salvation? What does it mean to have a relationship with Jesus? And then we looked at what the Bible says about assurance of salvation, how a person can know for certain that they have a relationship with Jesus. Then we considered what the Bible is, God's Word, what authentic prayer looked like. We dealt with the issue of how do we deal with temptation and sin. Then we spent a Sunday looking at the importance of being part of a church. And then last week we looked at the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper and how they play a part in our lives as Christians. And certainly there are many more topics or different topics that could be included in a, a, a series on a primer of a Christian life. Uh, but this morning I want to end with what does it mean to be a witness? Now I mentioned last week that the characteristics that the Lord's Supper and baptism have in common is that they are a witness, a public testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. In our tradition, we call them ordinances, not sacraments, because we do not believe that they convey grace. In other words, uh, getting baptized or taking the Lord's Supper uh, does not convey grace. It's not going to sanctify you or save you. They do not make you a Christian, but they are the testimony or the witness that you are a question. But the testimony of belonging to Jesus is demonstrated uh, far more than just in believers' baptism and in taking the Lord's Supper. After his resurrection and immediately before his ascension into heaven, Jesus told a group of about 120 disciples here in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in all Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. During the Renaissance, Erasmus, one of the great scholars, is credited with telling a myth mythical tale that when Jesus returned to heaven after his time on earth, that all the angels gathered around because they were really curious about what he had experienced. They wanted to hear what happened to him. And so Jesus told them about the miracles that he performed, the people that he had met, about his teaching, his death, and his resurrection. And afterwards, Michael the archangel said, but Lord, what happens now? And Jesus said, I've left behind 11 faithful men who will declare my message and share my love, and these faithful men will build my church. And Michael said, but what if they fail? And Jesus said, I have no other plan. Jesus told his disciples and all Christians, including you and me by application, that we are to be his witnesses. One commentary said the meaning of the clause, you will be my witnesses, is subject to question. Is this a command or a simple statement of fact? Grammatically, the words could be taken either way, but because of Acts 10.42, it is clearly an imperative in the future tense. And I thought, well, what does Acts 10.42 say? Well, Acts 10.42 is part of a message that the apostle Peter had earlier delivered to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile whom God had, Peter had, God had sent Peter to him. And in that message to Cornelius and his household, this is what Peter said. Now, I'm going to begin in verse 38 of Acts chapter 10. 
You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went out doing good and healing all who were pressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all these things he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen before him by God, that is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Notice that twice Peter says that he and the other disciples were witnesses, not just to what Jesus said and did, but to his entire ministry, including his resurrection, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so in Acts chapter 10, verse 42, Peter says that God ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as the judge of the living and the dead. Jesus called Peter and the other apostles to go into the world where people did not know about him and give a truthful account of what they had heard and experienced. And since they had witnessed his perfect life and teachings, his suffering and his death and his burial and his resurrection, they were to go out and give a truthful testimony about him. But it's not just the apostles or even the early disciples that were to be witnesses. Every believer in Jesus is called to be a witness. Another commentary said, notice that the call to witness is not limited to any select group of people since it spreads from the apostles to 120 believers and on throughout the pages of Acts. Nor can we restrict it only to service in our own churches or to some kind of professional ministry. Every believer should be a world Christian, able to function for the Savior from the other side of the street to the other side of the world. I like that definition. A basic truth of what it means to be a Christian is that you and I are to be witnesses of Christ. Now, I'm probably not telling you something you don't already know. And if you're like many people, approaching the subject of being a witness can make you feel uncomfortable, perhaps even guilty, because witnessing on a regular basis The people without Christ is not something we often do. We know that we're supposed to, we just don't do it. According to some research, most unchurched Americans say they have multiple Christian friends, but those friends haven't shared with them how or why they should follow Jesus. For example, in a 2016 study of 2,000 unchurched Americans, LifeWay Research found an openness to religious conversations, especially with Christian friends and family. Yet few individuals say they've ever had someone explain to them how to become a Christian. Close to two in three unchurched Americans say they have multiple Christian friends with whom they interact. And while 47% are open to general conversations, 79% of the unchurched said they don't mind a Christian friend talking about their faith. And despite the openness of relationships with Christians, few unchurched Americans have ever had someone explain exactly to how to become a Christian or why they think they should do so. In fact, they said only about 29% say that a Christian has ever shared with them one-on-one how to become a Christian. Now listen, my intent is not to to put a guilt trip on anyone or certainly to stand in this pulpit and sanctimoniously try to hammer people about not sharing their faith because not only would that be wrong, it would be personally hypocritical. What I would rather do is encourage us about being a witness. The fact that God has called us to be a witness, he's already equipped us to be a witness, and that we can be effective witnesses. So with that in mind, I want to begin, first of all, just a a clarification of what it means to be a witness. What is a witness? Well, I think there's a really good illustration also found in the book of Acts that again involves the Apostle Peter. Remember that on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached a sermon and uh, to the Jews who were there because of Pentecost, and Peter did not mince any words. 
Uh, for example, he says, This man delivered, oh, by the pre predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Peter continues this lengthy sermon in Acts chapter 2, and he concludes it, and, uh, and then at, towards the end of the sermon, the Bible says, and with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word and were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. What a sermon. I'm not good at math, but I think I got this right. That the church grew by 2,500% after one message. And it continued to grow. Peter didn't stop preaching about Jesus. And in the fourth chapter of Acts, it says, As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid their hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Now, I don't, I don't know if 5,000 is a new total or if it's 5,000 a new addition, but people are responding to the truth of Peter's teaching to the point that Peter and at least John are arrested and thrown into jail by the Sanhedrin. The next day they're brought before the Jewish high council and they're interrogated by the Jewish leaders who command Peter and John not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And here's Peter's answer. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Did you catch it? That's the definition of a witness. A witness is somebody who tells what he's seen and heard. Warren Wearsby wrote, When you are on the witness stand in court, the judge isn't interested in your ideas or opinions. He only wants to hear what you know. Our English word martyr comes from this Greek word translated witness. And many of God's people have sealed their witness by laying down their lives. If you're a witness of Jesus, what is it that you know? We well, you know one thing that's true of every believer in Christ is that they have a testimony. Now, you and I are, I, we're, I are not, were not eyewitnesses of Jesus, of his life and resurrection like the apostles, but we are witnesses of his grace in our own lives, which is essentially what a testimony is. We all have a salvation story if you know Jesus personally. Now, there's a misconception that to be a witness means you have to know the Bible really, really, really well or have successfully completed some kind of formal evangelistic training. We're going to get to that shortly. You may think, I don't know how to witness. But if you're saved, you know what happened to you. You have a testimony that you can share. Let me give you an example. The Gospel of John records a miracle of healing that Jesus performed on a man who had been born blind. Now think about that. He had never seen a sunrise. He had never seen the beauty of creation. He had never seen the face of his parents or friends. Everything up to this point had been dark. And then Jesus healed him. And for the first time in his life, he sees. I, I can't even imagine what, what that must have been like for this man, how amazing and awesome it was. And John says, therefore, the neighbors and those who previously, previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? And others were saying, this is he? And others were saying, no, uh, but he's like him. And he kept saying, I'm the one. So they were saying to him, how then were your eyes open? He answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. And I went away and washed, and I received my sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. The problem 
is that Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath, which did not escape the notice of the Pharisees. So John says, then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes, I washed and I see. And so they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. I can't help but wonder if it might have been, he's a prophet? I, I, I don't think he really knows. The Pharisees ask, Pharisees ask him the same question that the neighbors asked, the question we would all probably ask, what happened to you? How is it that you can see? And the man gives the same answer. Notice that this, this, this whole thing has now gone from neighbors who knew him to Pharisees who don't know him. In fact, they don't even believe that he is the guy who was, who was blind from birth. And so a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man, talking about Jesus, is a sinner. And then he answered, the man says, Whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know. That though I was blind, now I see. I love that answer because it is the soul of a testimony. The blind man didn't know where Jesus was or exactly who he was. But centuries before John Newton ever penned the words to amazing grace, this man gave his testimony. His testimony. One thing I know. I was blind. And now I see. You see, your testimony is telling others what God has done in your life. Now, we all have had a life before Jesus and a life after Jesus. And some of you may have become a Christian when you were an adult or an older youth. And, and so some of the differences in your life are really clear and obvious. But there are others here this morning, and you received Jesus as a very young child. And so the difference isn't really all that clear. I mean, how much trouble did you get into at five years old? I don't know. When I first became a Christian, I heard testimonies of people who were saved out of alcoholism and drugs and immoral behavior and other sins. In fact, a very good friend of mine in college came to know Jesus when he was in prison. And compared to their testimonies, mine seemed kind of dull and boring. And there was kind of a temptation, you know, to try to make yourself out worse than you really are, a, a worse sinner than I was. But then I read Psalm 103, verse 10. And this is what the psalmist writes. He, God, has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Now, in the context, the psalmist is describing God's grace that despite our sin, God hasn't given us what we deserve. When I read it, though, I took it another way. I had made another application. And my application was, let me read it again, he's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. And what I understood is, God doesn't reward us for breaking bad. There's nothing good about boasting how sinful you were. I understood the verse to mean kind of more about the, the, the flavor of what Paul says uh, when he's describing his own life before he came to know Jesus. And he says, whatever things were gained to me, those I've considered as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. And I got to tell you, I stopped trying to make myself out, you know, like, boy, God really had to go all out to save me. No, he didn't. You would hear people talk about being radically saved. Can I tell you something? If you know Jesus Christ, you have been radically saved. If God saved you out of a life of despair and destruction and dysfunction, then you have a testimony of God's grace. But if you were saved as a child in Sunday school or Awana or at a Christian camp and you have sought to live faithfully for Jesus ever since, praise God for your testimony of his grace in your life that has kept you and protected you from wasting your life by becoming involved in the things of the world. Your testimony is sharing what God's done in your life. You have one. And perhaps 
uh, it is uh, a simple and as concise as all I know is once I was blind and now I see. Whatever it is, you should know how to communicate it. So I want to make a suggestion. If you've never done this, sit down and write out your testimony. Put into words what God has done for you. We're not looking for a novel. We're looking for something that you could just share in a couple minutes. If you want some help, let your pastors know, and we'll help you. A witness is someone who tells what he or she has seen and heard. The second thing I want to mention this morning is the character of the life of a witness. Every believer is a witness. The question is, what kind of witness? Because it's possible to know the content of the gospel or even know how to share your faith and not, not be an effective witness because witnessing is more than just doing, it's being. Jesus told his followers, you will be my witnesses. Our witness is, is as much about who we are as what we say. So if you have your Bible, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And let's spend a few moments here. Because I think this is one of the most powerful and relevant verses in the Bible about witnessing. And this is what Peter says. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Now the context of this verse is a contrast to what the believers to whom Peter were writing and experiencing. They were suffering and being persecuted for their Christian faith and for doing what was right. And so what Peter says, instead of fearing what people might do, Peter commands them to set apart, to consecrate Jesus as Lord. Do not let this phrase slip by you, but sanctify Make Jesus Lord of your life. So how do you sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts? We do so day by day. Submitting ourselves as living sacrifices to God. Allowing God to take control of everything. Every circumstance, every decision, every trial or struggle or problem, difficulty or crisis. It is in the words of a country gospel song to let Jesus take the wheel. Or in an older hymn, puts it this way, living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free, this is the pathway of blessing for me. Peter challenges us to live a life that is true. One person said the proof of Christianity is not in a book but in a life. The power of Christianity is not in a creed, but a Christian character. And whatever you see life, and wherever you see life that has been transformed by the graces of, grace of God, you see a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. Making Jesus Lord of our lives, seeking to live faith, faithfully for Him in obedience to God's Word, and yielding to the Holy Spirit are essential to the kind of witnesses that we are to be. Now I want to say, I don't think any of us live the Christian life perfectly. But I'm not so sure that people without Jesus are looking for perfection. What they are looking for and what they need to see, though, is authenticity and honesty. Following Jesus affects all of our life. Our priorities, our values, our ethics, our morality, our everyday behavior, our response to difficulty and crisis and tragedy. And you know, often it's that response that proves to be more powerful of a witness to onlooking eyes than you would ever imagine. You know, there may not be a lot of differences between what Christians experience and what unbelievers experience in life. But the difference is that we do not face life alone. But we rest in the care of a loving, sovereign God who causes all things to work together for good to them who love God. The God who makes meaning out of our mess, who has purpose for each of us and has promised never to leave or forsake you. We experience peace that passes understanding. We have joy that's inexpressible. And we know a love that's immeasurable. And when others see our hope, assurance, and confidence, especially when life is hard, we become a fragrance of life. 
to a lost and dying world. William Barclay wrote, More people have been brought into the church by the kindness of real Christian love than by all the theological arguments in the world. And more people have been driven from the church by the hardness and ugliness of so-called Christianity than all of the doubts in the world. Researcher George Gallup said, the fact that nine in 10 Americans are not committed Christians is worthy of concern. A witness for Jesus without walking with Jesus is worthless. We witness with our lives. We witness with our words. Now let's consider there's one other thought this morning, and that is the content of the message of a witness. Peter says that the first step in being a witness is to sanctify Jesus as Lord in your hearts, but then he continues, always being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. The New Living Translation translate, as you are asked about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. You know, the Boy Scout motto, which was created in 1907 by Robert Baden Powell, an English soldier, is be prepared. Upon hearing that scout motto, someone asked the scouting founder the inevitable follow-up question, be prepared for what? His answer was, why, for any old thing, he replied. Later, uh, in a magazine, Scouting for Boys, he wrote that be prepared means you are always in a state of readiness in mind and body to do your duty. I think be prepared could also be the Christian witness motto as well. Peter says always be ready. Ready for what? Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. The Greek word for defense is where we get our English word apology or apologetic from, which does not mean that we're supposed to say we're sorry that we're a Christian. It means that we're supposed to give a defense. In other words, we need to be prepared to defend our faith to anyone who asks us about the hope that is in us. One person explained it this way. We are not only to give our testimony, but we are also to show from the Bible why we are Christians. We should be thinking through our theology now, and this takes some mental effort. We are to always be ready to give an answer. We Christians must not only be ready, we should also be eager and willing to speak out concerning our hope in Christ to share the basic elements of our faith. We are to make a defense. That is, we are to give a reasonable, logical, intelligent answer, not an emotional response or theological discourse, but an explanation of what Christ has done in our lives and why we have the assured hope of heaven. I mentioned earlier that there's a misconception that to be a witness, you have to know the Bible really well or have successfully completed some kind of formal evangelistic training and that we would get to it shortly. Well, it's shortly. Peter says that we are to be prepared to defend the reason for our hope to everyone who asks us. That means we need to know God's word and how to use it and how to use it with different kinds of people because the implication is that for most of us, that is going to involve some kind of training or discipline or equipping involved in sharing the message of Christ which I don't think contradicts what I said earlier about what a witness is. That was a statement about identity. This is a statement about ability. Howard Hendricks once stated, in the midst of a generation screaming for answers, Christians are stuttering. Being able to articulate and communicate your own personal testimony is a good first step. But your testimony alone is not going to save anyone. It is the power of God's word that the Holy Spirit uses to convict people of their need for Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Jesus said that we were to be his witnesses, but he prefaced his statement with, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He promised his disciples two things, power and and witness. It was not you are going to be witnesses and then receive power, but the other way around, you're going to receive the power, which is going to result then in you being witnesses. Dr. Bill Bright, 
who founded Crew, formerly Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, many years ago wrote, and who also wrote the Four Spiritual Law booklet, I had a good definition of evangelism. He said, evangelism involves sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. To know a gospel presentation and how to share it is a necessary and invaluable tool in order to share your faith. But I want you to see something that Peter's challenge involves even a more comprehensive ability than just a gospel presentation implied by the phrases to everyone who asks you, yet with gentleness and reverence. The sense is not that we take our one and only pre-canned gospel presentation and attempt to beat people in submission to Jesus, but know how to answer people, different kinds of people, right where they are. In an old Peanuts cartoon, Lucy says to Charlie Brown, I would make a great evangelist. And Charlie Brown answers, is that so? She says, yes. I convinced the boy in front of me in school that my religion is better than his religion. Well, how did you do that? And Lucy said, I hit him over the head with my lunchbox. Well, <laughs> that might be the power of persuasion, but that's not spirit-empowered evangelism. All evangelism, all witnessing, is eventually confrontational in, in the sense that it involves speaking to people and telling them the gospel. As important as living an authentic lifestyle as a witness is, that does not guarantee that they'll know you are a Christian, and even if they do know, it doesn't mean that they will ask. So I am not saying we should never initiate a conversation with someone in order to share Christ. What I am saying is that when they ask, we have to be ready with the right knowledge and the right attitude because their eternal destiny is at stake. George Barna noted that there's a significant change in evangelistic approach that's taking place in the United States. He says young adults are much more likely to share their faith through ongoing discussions with friends and through emails, instant messaging conversations than middle-aged and older folks. They are less likely to engage in means that their generation finds offensive, such as street preaching or moral confrontation. The early signs suggest that the emerging generation, the mosaics, who pri presently are in their early 20s down through childhood, will continue along this vein. Ministry seeking to prepare people to effectively share their faith in today's society would advance the process by enabling young adults to carry on knowledgeable conversations about the substance of their Christian faith and how it affects all dimensions of a person's life. The ability to relate biblical principles to current issues and personal struggles, that is, to, enter, uh, to interact beyond the level of just getting saved, will be crucial for future effective outreach efforts. And I thought, isn't that what Peter just said? There was a skeptic, a promised, a, 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 a British, a, a skeptic promised a British preacher from centuries ago, Alexander McLaren, that he would attend his church for four Sundays, which McLaren would be presenting the main tenets of Christianity. The skeptic listened intently to McLaren's sermons, and after the fourth message, he presented himself for church membership, saying that he had received Christ as his Savior. McLaren was delighted, and he couldn't resist the impulse to ask which of the four sermons brought him to this decision. And the skeptic replied, your sermon, sir, were helpful. But what finally persuaded me, he said, is that one Sunday after church, I was helping an elderly lady on a slippery walk, and she looked me in the face and said, I wonder if you know Jesus, my Savior. He's everything in the world to me, and I would like you to know him too. He said it was that simple comment with the working of Holy Spirit that changed a skeptic's heart more than any powered-filled sermon could. So you are a witness. Question is, do you need to be? Do you want to be more equipped to be a witness? So let me, uh, let me make a couple suggestions then. Uh, I mentioned this early. Create your testimony. Write it down. Learn it. Share it with someone. And again, if you need someone to practice on, Pastor Jim and I are available. 
I'd love to hear your testimony. Learn a simple gospel presentation. It doesn't have to be complicated. Identify people in your life who are not Christians and start praying for them. Ask God for opportunities to have gospel conversations with people. And I realize that this might take some time, probably going to challenge you and move you out of your comfort zone. So I want to give you a way to share Christ in an easy, non-threatening way. Out on the table in the foyer, there's a stack of these little gospel tracts that explain John 3.16. There are a hundred of them. Well, actually, there's 99 because I have one. <laughs> I invite you to take one of these tracks, if you will use it. And here's what you could do with it. You could ask someone if you could read this to them and get their opinion. You could give it to someone who needs Jesus and ask them to read it. You could put it somewhere where you're certain it will be read. Or you could leave it with a generous tip after a meal. It's a small step of faith, but it's one that God can use. Remember my college friend who was in prison? He came to know Christ, partly due to a gospel tract that a Christian prison guard dropped into his cell. Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even the remotest part of the earth. In Jerusalem, they were to evangelize their own community. In Judea, they were to evangelize their own country. In Samaria, they were to evangelize their own continent. and the remotest part of the earth, they were to evangelize all the world. And it was kind of an interesting word he said, interesting word he says, but you will, uh, you will be my witnesses both, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the most part of the earth. Both means all at once and all at the same time. Be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Let's pray together.